downtown Nashville, Tennessee. Amy and I, you can't see Amy, but uh, Amy of Church Answers and I used to work in a series of buildings um, called Lifeway. And we had 1.1 million square feet of space. And even well before COVID, we had too much space. There's a reason for that. Um, the printing presses used to be there. We outsourced that. The distribution centers were downtown. We moved them to another town where you wouldn't have to bring big trucks to the heart of downtown Nashville. Eventually, we sold the property and we moved close by just a few blocks away, just a few blocks north. Now, why am I telling you that story? Well, I have vivid memories of negotiating the sale of the property to a company to a developer who would eventually build what was one of the largest, probably is the largest downtown Nashville project in a booming area. One of the first tenants to say we want a piece of that was Amazon. Amazon bought land to build two big office towers. What is happening there? One of them's filled. They're going to hire 5,000 people. One of them's already filled. How about the second one? The second one is vacant. They're going to build a shell, but they're not going to build it out because most of those new people that would come in would rather work from home or work from somewhere else. Things have changed. Similarly, maybe not with that type of dramatic number or size, but similarly, there's new rules for office hours in the church and where people work or don't work. Sam's going to be leading us in this discussion because he's on the front lines of it. And we're going to be talking about working from home, maintaining consistent office hours, should you. We're going to talk about the new rules for staff office hours because the things they are changing. Once again, we want to thank our sponsor, Logos. According to a recent survey, 30% of evangelical church goers want more in-depth teaching. If you want to go deeper into the word, Logos is the Bible study platform for you. Incredible platform. Logos fuses powerful technology and biblical resources. You can have multiple translations of the Bible, including Greek, Hebrew, and that portion that is Aramaic, search tools, commentary, seminary level courses, audio books, and 200,000 digital books in this Incredible platform. Logos is now more affordable. You can get started. Try it out for $49. Go to logos.com slash church answers. You can also see it in the show notes. Sam, the times they are changing. I believe that's Bob Dylan, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Yeah, I think I think uh, so. Um so we looked at this issue back in 2016, and a lot has changed in the years since we have first examined this idea of work from home, uh, consistent office hours, all of those things. But I'll start with a very just basic point. Trust. That is the number one thing. You, you don't make requirements of your team, whatever those may be, because you don't trust them. If you don't trust your team, that's that's the problem. <laughs> you can't you can't force trust through, re, you know, required office hours. Uh, you you can't enforce trust. Either you have hired people that are trustworthy or they are not. Either you are trustworthy or you are not. So trust is paramount. No matter what system you put in place, no matter what kinds of office hours you have, whether you have hybrid work from home or what have you, trust is the first thing. So I would just put and, that out there and say, don't enforce trust through these requirements. Allow me to interject because you are reminding me why? I mean, that, that that is really insightful. You're reminding me why Church Answers team works as well as it does. It's because of Amy. I mean, Amy and Jana. Well, I know. I know that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm talking about all of us. Uh, if, if you count everybody that's a regular part of our team, we have 28 people as of this recording. Um, two of us live in Franklin, Tennessee, which is our headquarters. The rest of us are scattered about. We have even Nigi, who is in Nigeria, and, and we, we have Steve in, in Canada. We have people in multiple states that uh, work for Church Answers, and, and we have Richmond in Uganda that's really a part of our team, too. But the reason it works is we trust each other. I'm not worried 
I do worry about, say, Amy, because I'm worried that she's working too much, not too little. I'm not worried about her hours, except that she's giving too many to them. I trust our team. I really do. And you are explaining why the Church Answers team works as well as it does. And I know you want to talk about churches, but I just had to interject that. It was, you know, the little light bulb went figuratively over my head when you said that. Yeah, which gets us kind of to our next point. Don't don't make a rule for everyone to deal with an individual problem. Um, if you have one person on your team or two people on your team that are an issue, well, don't create rules for everyone to deal with problems that are individual problems. Far That happens in the corporate world. That happens in the academy. That happens in the church. Everybody seems to do this and it, just deal with the individuals that are the problems. Don't make rules for everyone. It, everyone knows. You, here's the thing. Everybody knows you're doing it anyway. <laughs> they, they get it. <laughs> I mean, when when everyone knows the, the one or two people that are a problem and then when you make a rule to deal with them, you, you know, you're, one, it's a bit it's passive aggressive leadership uh, and everyone knows that you're doing. It's not a secret. So you might as well just deal with it. Um, trust your team and then deal with the individual problems when you have them. On, on our on our team, Brad Wagner probably deals as much with polity and um, leadership issues as anyone in terms of bylaws, polity. And he's, it, what he says happens a lot. He'll look at bylaws and they have been idiot proofed. In other words, they have so many rules because there are two or three idiots that have violated the rules. And so they idiot proof the bylaws instead of having simple bylaws. And he said he can read bylaws and he can recognize what problems the church has had in the past. And similar to what you're saying there about the rules for office hours. Yeah, about personnel manuals, policies, procedures, bylaws. The, you're going to have stuff about staff in all of those different documents. Uh, it's, it's not good practice at all. And it kills morale to make rules for everyone that really only pertain to an individual. Um, I will say this. So I'm going to go out on a limb and here's, here's what I want to mention next. I think it is, it is good for there to be some required office hours in churches. Um, because I know for us, we have meetings on Tuesdays and we have midweek programming on Wednesdays. So, and obviously Sunday mornings, um, so it's good to require certain office hours so that everyone can be on site at least for part of the week. We don't have required office hours Monday through Friday. I think that's that's ridiculous. Say everyone's got to be here on site eight to five Monday through Friday. That's archaic. If you're doing that to your team, you're not getting out of your team what you need to get out of them. The church is not being ministered to. The neighborhood's not being reached. But I do think that one or two days a week is adequate and I would caution anybody that would say we're going to be all remote all the time. I, I've heard of some churches that are doing that, and guess what? They're coming back and asking for coaching and saying, how do I get everyone back in the office? Because our staff meetings really don't work on Zoom all that well all the time. Um, so I do think that it is good for creativity. It's good for accountability. It's good for morale um, that everyone would be on site at least at least one day a week, if not two. Yep, and I wish – the church answers could meet in person on a regular basis. It would help us. I really do. We're not. And so th that's we obviously are not going to make people move all to one city. That would be silly. Um, but I think we would be better if we could do that. Uh, we physically can't. Um, we do try to get together, you know, throughout the and year, but it's uh, it's not something that we do weekly. Um, yeah, it's. It's so much better when when we're in the room, the physical room with each other. And, you know, at, at some point, I hope the church answers will be going to more frequent in-person gatherings, but we're scattered. So it's going to be it's going to be hard to make it a monthly thing. You know, I want, also want to talk about a trend that I think is going to occur um, that you need to be on the lookout for. Um, historically, if you didn't live in the area where you ministered, it was kind of a problem. And there's always these one-off cases where I know my first full-time church, I couldn't afford to live in the neighborhood where the church was. It was just way too expensive. So I had to live 15, 20 minutes away. Um, I, and I get those cases where, hey, 
I, I'm just priced out of the neighborhood. I'm priced out of the community. I have to live 30 minutes away or an hour away. Or, you know, there's, there's some pastors that have two and three churches and, you know, they, they do a circuit, basically a circuit ride. There, there are people out there that are still doing that. So I'm not talking about the one-offs, but I am talking about uh, just as a general rule, as work from home becomes more popular, people are going to be tempted to live further and further away from the church where they work. And I think that is a mistake. I, I don't think I know that is a mistake because if you work from home a lot, I mean, living in the community is more important than ever. You you still need to live in the community where you minister. You, you still need to be an active missionary in the community where you are. Um, so as work from home becomes more popular, especially in churches, uh, don't you, you've got to put some limits on staff living an hour away uh, if that's occurring. Um, there will be that temptation. I don't know how popular it is right now, uh, but I do see it becoming a potential problem in the future if churches do not work hard to keep people in the neighborhood where the church is. Well, we know a popular movement is migration to some rural areas, migration to some small towns, migrations to affordable, more affordable places, even states. Uh, the church is not going to be able to do that if it's going to remain the gathered church. The gathered church will need a gathered staff on a regular basis, and they need to be present in the neighborhood as well. So I'm, I'm totally with you, and I think the temptation is going to be to work from anywhere that is going to get you out of the community. That is a good warning. It needs to be heeded. Yeah, I'm seeing the beginnings of that trend. I don't know how widespread it will be. Um, so this is more, it's less a prediction and more warning. Hey, just be careful. Don't let people live too far away. Um, if all of your staff lives an hour away, you, you're you not going to be in a healthy place as a church. You're just not. Um, so something to watch. Let's, let's look at this issue of uh, balancing flexibility that you want your team to have with accountability that they must have. <laughs> yes, I think you need both. Um, again, to require office hours Monday through Friday, eight to five, is is just too much. Uh, you're you're not in the community. You're not ministering to people. Uh, it's a it's a very selfish and controlling way to manage a team, uh, particularly in a church. Um, I understand if you're in a manufacturing facility, you've got to have people on the line and you need to be there at a specific time. But but churches don't work that way. Um, so people do need flexibility. Uh, we've had plenty. Of, I mean, it's every week that something happens off hours. Somebody, some minister is doing something off site in someone's home, at the hospital, at a school, somewhere off hours. They need flexibility. You, you can't just require office hours and expect all ministry to happen within that window. Ministry is happening 24 7. So there's the, the beauty of the flexibility of ministry because the, the hours are intense, but they're flexible. Um, but you also need accountability. So you're going to have to balance giving people that flexibility with accountability. And again, I think a good compromise is on-site staff meetings and having them having an on-site day, whatever day everyone chooses. And I think that's a helpful way to bring that accountability together because there's just, you just can't replace like popping in someone's office while they're there and saying, Hey, what about this? Um, that is missed when everyone is off-site and a lot of things will slip through the cracks. If you don't have some time together, this is not an overbearing thing. It's just a way to keep people accountable. It's a very simple way to hold people accountable. You cannot have accountability without presence. You have to be around people to hold, to have a, accountability. Um, accountability requires presence. Um, so give people flexibility. Don't be overbearing. But you know you're going to have to be careful with giving too much flexibility because even your best people will not. They'll want to do the right thing, but they won't know what the right thing is. Um, so you've got to, you've got to balance accountability with flexibility. You you uh, mentioned that the more you work from home, you're going to sacrifice three things: community. Totally agree. Yep, you're not physically there. It's hard to have digital community that has any semblance of the quality of in person community. Uh, you're you're going to sacrifice teamwork. Yeah. Exactly right. The team works better when they are together in proximity. And then you talk about creativity. First time I saw you put that there, I was almost ready to challenge you and say, I like being alone for my creativity. And then I realized 
how much of my creativity takes place in teams rather than in isolation. And if I did everything by myself, my creativity would sink. And so I write books, but I don't write books that, and you write books, we don't write them in isolation. We write them because of experiences and information that we get in the context of others. So I'm no longer going to challenge that. This introvert will say to the extrovert son, I think you're right on all three. Well, creativity within the church requires collaboration. Individual creativity is certainly possible. It can be a beautiful thing. One person can't come up with one idea on their own and execute it all on their own, and it'd be fine. But generally speaking, you're going to get better creativity out of collaboration with people. And the only way that you're going to get that collaboration is being together in the same room and bouncing ideas off each other. Um, so I do think you sacrifice potential creativity when nobody's around each other. Um, it, it becomes a very weird, siloed, isolated, uh, individualistic kind of approach to a church. And none of those things are healthy for, for a church. An, an adjunct to this, you also sacrifice execution of your creativity when you're not around people. So we're in beta test right now of a, of a ministry that will announce full fledged that has got me off the charts excited called the hope initiative. It's a, it's a combination prayer and evangelism initiative that we really think is moving churches outwardly focused. And so I've, I've had all kind of ideation for it. Chuck Lawless is leading it on our team, but I ideated it. Uh, my mind's just been full of things. And I met with Jenna and Amy, our two VPs. And they started asking me questions about execution. What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do? With I don't know. And it's common sense type of things that I had not even considered. Like, are you going to tell them to go from A to B? Well, I don't know. Well, then how, what happens from B to C? Well, I don't know. I said, can y'all handle it for me? Well, again, that's creativity that needed execution. And I well, could have Or they're just doing your that. job for you. That's the story of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> you can call that creativity if you like. I call that picking up the slack. Okay. Okay. Well, I wanted to add the execution part. Uh, the more office hours you require, the more you might miss out on good candidates because there is a reality of the workforce right now that wants to know that they do have some flexibility. Yeah. Can, you, can you imagine doing an interview and, you know, we've got a position at the church. It's a full-time position, you know, pay, pay pretty good, good benefits. Okay. What are the office hours? Monday through Friday, eight to five. <laughs> what kind of candidate are you going to get for that? I mean, there's probably somebody that would sign up for it, but you know, you're, you're just not going to get quality candidates if you're overbearing with your office hours. You're just not. I mean, that's just the bottom line. If you want good candidates, you're going to have to give them more flexibility. And the best ones will use that flexibility for the benefit of the church, for their families. Um, it will be a good thing for everybody. So it, it's not like you're sacrificing quality of work or quantity of work by giving people flexibility. But when you are overbearing on your office hours, you definitely miss out on some of the better candidates. Yep. Yep. I can certainly see that. Well, this is fascinating, Sam, this whole thing about office hours. This world is changing rapidly. That's cliche-ish, but it is. And uh, a lot of it has to do with how the workforce is taking place. I am reading a lot of, of uh, articles and other research on this whole thing about what is taking place. And uh, it's it's not going where a lot of the pundits had predicted. Uh, a lot of pundits had predicted they will return and we will get 80 percent of normalcy. Now, I just read an article that said we may get 50 to 60 percent of normalcy. And I began to think about what are the implications there for vacant office space? Everything was built upon 100 percent occupancy in terms of people working in those offices. And now they're not. There's a lot of questions out there. We'll continue to try to provide the answers for churches because we're church answers. <laughs> you got, got church questions. We got church answers. Church. And we do have an answer that we want to tell you about, and that is a resource that Tyndale has recently published. Uh, you've got to check out Live Your Truth and Other Lies by Alyssa Childers. 
She is a best-selling author of Another Gospel, and this book helps you examine modern lies that are disguised as truths in today's culture. It's, uh, again, Live Your Truth and Other Lies. Uh, everyday messages of peace, fulfillment, and empowerment swirl around social media. You see them all the time. Uh, on the surface, they seem like sentiments of freedom and hope, and in reality, they are deeply deceptive. The best lies are the ones that sound the most beautiful. These lies that you hear all the time, like, live your truth. You are enough. God just wants you to be happy. All those sound so good, but you know what? They're very deceptive. So this is a book about planting our feet on the bedrock of God's truth. Truth that, that does not evolve with cultural trends. Live your truth and other lies. It is available October 18th. It is a much needed book in today's culture. I hope that you wrote that down or put it, you know, on a note to go pick it up. Live Your Truth and Other Lies by Alyssa Childers. Thank you, Tyndale, for publishing the book and for being a sponsor. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in once again to Rainer on Leadership. We're here every week, so we'll see you same time, same place next week on the next episode.